I'm fascinated by the war on terror, this Islamic extremism, and I did notice that anytime someone wants to talk with perspective on Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Al-Shabaab, all these extremist groups, they always reel back to Jefferson. They go back to Jefferson because Jefferson dealt with it first. So anytime somebody like Jim Safka, who works at the Jefferson Library, would write, or Rick Victor Davis Hansen would write, they say, well, listen, let me tell you how long this war is going to last because it started 200 years ago. So that brought me to Thomas Jefferson, the one who confronted Islamic extremism back then. And the more I looked, the more I understood that this is a story that had to be told and brought out, but in a way that's readable. And that's why I wanted to bring it forward, because you know all the central characters, to open the book. Adams, Jefferson, playing a huge role. But when you close the book, you're going to know people like William Eaton, Stephen Decatur, Edward Preble, the so-called average everyday Americans who do extraordinary things in order, and of course, um, Presley O'Bannon, the Marine, uh, and a handful of Marines that did extraordinary things. They lived and died without any claims. Some had fame in their day, but they didn't last through it. And I thought if I could bring some of them out, it's worth the trip. And I did. So Thomas Jefferson, we have this problem. The year is 1785. Uh, we don't even have a president yet, but we've got our first enemy. It is the, these four nations off of North Africa, uh, Morocco, Tunis, Algeria, and we now know as Tripoli, which we now know as Libya. We don't have a problem with them. We have merchant ships and no navy to guide them. But as we go past North Africa, these pirates, using the Koran as their excuse, would, would take our crews hostage, hold them out for ransom. They take all the cargo and take the ships. Next thing you know, we got these horror stories of these guys being held against their will. Some of them murdered right on the spot, and they want ransom. We got a problem. We're buried in war debt. We have no navy. We have no army. We try to convince them they have no enemy. So it's up to Jefferson, who's in France, and uh, uh, John Adams, who's in England, to start talking to the Tripoli ambassador, the Morocco ambassador, the Algiers ambassador, the Tunis ambassador, and say, hey, guys, your problem's with Europe. It's not with me. We know what it's like to be oppressed and have people rule. We're not your problem. And they said, well, you are a problem. And one of the quotes was from the ambassador who they thought they were winning over. All nations which had not acknowledged the prophet, Muhammad, were sinners, whom it was the right and duty of the faithful to plunder and enslave. Christian sailors were plain and simple, fair game. Now, after a couple of days where they were optimistic, that statement really threw off Adams and Jefferson. And they took it diff differently. So for Jefferson said, we got to fight him. And we got to fight him because if you, don't punish the fin uh, if you don't punish the first insult, more will follow. He goes, weakness provokes insult and injury. A condition to punish is often prevents it. I think it's in our interest to punish the first insult because insults unpunished is the parent of many others. How smart is Jefferson? Not a fighter. When they told him to get a militia together and fight, he said, not nah, really, I'm more of a thinker. But when it came to this, he said, we got to fight. He was very aware of how we were being perceived, even today. If not, it's not enough to have strength, you've got to show you can use it and willingness to do it. Sadly, it's still the playground principle. The weakest one gets picked on. We see it today. Even though we're at this intellectual stage of cyber technology and we're walking on the moon and we're going back, doesn't matter. It's still the same principle. Now, um, to, to, uh, I should say John Adams said we can't fight him because we're going to have to fight him forever. I hate to tell you, but they're both right. So Jefferson says... I'm going to give you this one because we don't have this thing called a navy. He wanted to get the rest of the countries to help and protect us, but they had no interest. They wanted us to fail. I found out early on our biggest enemy was every other Western government because they knew if we were successful, if you're in the absolute monarch business, this whole election thing, not good. <laughs> if you're a king running for election, not really good. But if this works in America where people leave power, have a say in a quality of life, that could change everything. And they're losing their finest people to this place called the United States of America. Not because of it's easy, because it has an opportunity to provide happiness and liberty. That's it, it was brutal early on. You talk about not knowing what's next every day, but people here in America, we don't want an easy time, we want a fair time. We want a, we want a chance at success. We don't want it guaranteed. And that's what I find that's written over and over again. As people push west and push uh, south, they said, okay, we want a fresh start, we want a fresh start. Even when they went to when Texas, America wasn't fresh enough with 18 states. They go, we're going to Texas and start all over again. Prices are just going through the roof. It makes me laugh out loud when I read this. So what we ended up doing is uh, Adams became president, excuse me, Washington became president. He brings Adams, and, uh, Adams in with Jefferson. He says, guys, we've got a problem. 
They have hundreds of our guys hostage. A lot of our ships keep getting captured. They don't want to go through North Africa. And our number one client is in the Medi or through the Mediterranean. What are we going to do about it? He said, well, we got this extraordinary price to pay, essentially extortion. And that's what Adams recommends he pays. Jefferson says, my, my sense as Secretary of State, my recommendation is we don't pay it, we fight him. So Washington says, we still don't have a Navy. I'm going to go half and half. I'm going to provide the money and provide the contracts to build six ships. But I'm going to go with Adams. I'm going to write the checks to these countries so our guys stay safe. Next thing you know, the ships are done. Adams is president. Adams goes, yeah, I'm more worried about France. Sorry. I'm not going to talk to those guys. They're crazy. I'm not going to deal with it. Well, when he loses after one term, Jefferson doesn't declare war, but he stops making the payments. They declare war on us. Game on. So he's able to send ships over. In the beginning, we got the wrong leaders, the wrong admirals, the wrong captains. But what does America do? We correct, we rotate, we correct, we get some synergy between them, we get some communication ability, and sooner or later, we're able to seal off the harbors and begin to strangle Tripoli, who chopped down our, uh, our flag and said, game on, it's war. They took 300 plus of our guys and they're under horrendous conditions, many of which are murdered in the most horrific way possible that makes ISIS seem humanitarian. So William Eaton, who was an ambassador over there and is half Mike Ditka and half Thomas Jefferson with his intellect and Mike Ditka and his toughness, he said, listen, these people, these Muslim people are good people. They're horrible leaders. They're being oppressed. They don't know what we have. They don't know how bad they have it. If we could free them up from their leaders, there won't be a problem. And Jefferson says, no, we're going to keep it in the water for now. He goes, no, you're going to need a land invasion. Well, after a couple of years, what do Americans think when you take a couple of years to win a war? They get restless. They start looking at their leaders and saying, who elected this Jefferson guy? We're in an endless fight. We don't have our guys back. We're having these horrible stories written. These hostage uh, letters are coming back. So William Eaton said, you know my plan? So he goes, go see the Treasury Secretary. Get your money. We never had this conversation. So his plan is get a handful of Marines, go hire some mercenaries, get some guns, and get the deposed leader of Tripoli out of Egypt, go 500 miles through the desert without a map and without a nap. <laughs> through the desert, through mer with mercenaries, 500 miles, looking nothing at the stars, and take uh, the city of Derna, then Benghazi, then Tripoli. Sounds easy, right? Sounds impossible. All Jefferson wanted was word that we started a land invasion to make them come to the table to get our hostages back and forge an agreement where we no longer write checks. Well, they, everyone underestimated a guy you probably don't know named William Eaton. He marshals his troops. Incredible leadership, an unbelievable horseman, new, uh, new Arabic, was able to inspire his guys. And even though he got shot right away in the battle, in two hours took the city of Derna. And when he takes over, by the way, Spain, France, England, the powers of that day said, we will never do this because you're never going to have success. And we're doing it. And we're only a handful of years old, a couple of decades old. William Eaton takes Derna and then takes charge and says, hey, guys, they expect to be ruled and lord it over. He goes, no, I have no interest in that. What do you need? I'll provide it. I have no interest in oppressing you. They have a degree of freedom. And then when they start coming back in to try to take Derna back, the people of Derna started repelling their own army back. So here is William Eaton, Presley O'Bannon, a handful of Marines taking over a city just by providing freedom. Next stop Benghazi. Next stop Tripoli. Well, they are shuddering in Tripoli. And this guy, Tobias Lear, longtime aide to Washington, New aid, trying to make his name with Jefferson, cuts an early deal. Our guys get out, our guys get released, they come back a hero until they realize William Eaton came back and goes, let me tell you what we had, let me tell you what we blew. Well, James Madison had to finish the job. He went to all four of those countries. Not only did we get our guys back, because in the War of 1812 they started doing it again, they paid us for our trouble. To the point is, this is what the Pope of his day said about America. Pope Pius VII. And by the way, if I, had to, if, I might, if I was named Pope and there were six other Piuses, I'd probably pick a new name. <laughs> <laughs> Is there another name? <laughs> Not another Pius. The American commander, with a small force and in a short space of time, has done more for the cause of Christianity than the most powerful nations of Christendom have done for ages. So is this Brian Kilmeade, the Fox guy, singing red, white, and blue, making stories up to inspire patriotism in America? Or am I just highlighting something that we forgot about, that we didn't give enough attention to? 
Part of it is Jefferson. His resume is so great from the Louisiana Purchase, first Secretary of State, founding the University of Virginia, third President of the United States, uh, first Vice President of the United States, author of the Declaration of Independence. When you have a resume like that, it's easy to bury something that, you know, not many people knew how great it was what they did and what a problem would be. We would have no problem with this area of the world until 1980s, until Reagan had to bomb it again. And of course we have the problem now, which again, we're willing to take on straight on and they underestimated us and our willingness to go for total victory. And we have a president now that's doing just that. You probably don't know Stephen Decatur. There's a Decatur house, he was supposed to be president. Handsome guy, fearless guy. He would do hand-to-hand -hand combat, lead men into battle. You, he almost sounds like a, a mythological individual, but gets in a duel like people of that day would do constantly, even the smartest people, and he would die. One of his statements I just wanted to share with you. Our country, he stands up in one of his final toasts, says this. Our country, in her intercourse with foreign nations, may she always be in the right, but our country, right or wrong. And I think we gotta keep that in mind. Because when we're not in the right, we only do it because we think we're doing the right thing, and if it doesn't turn out right, it's not because we haven't researched it. And guess what? We're the type of country that would correct it.